Welcome to the critical analysis of Shakespeare's Macbeth. Shakespeare's great oeuvre has a special place for Macbeth. Macbeth has the subtitle in my PowerPoint presentation, which I am going to do now. As it says, life is but a walking shadow, a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. This kind of absurdity of life, Shakespeare mentions so strongly in Macbeth for many reasons. Before entering into the text, I would like to talk about, or rather drive home, a few points to approach Shakespeare, both as a text for the scholarly reading and as the script for theatrical performance, you see. As I told you, Shakespeare's Macbeth is his shortest, but the most violent tragedy. It was written in 1606. The source for this tragedy was borrowed from Collinshire's Chronicles. The Chronicles, published in 1587, covers the history of England, Scotland, and Ireland. So Shakespeare has borrowed this source from an English Scottish history. It involves both these countries. But to have the right understanding of Shakespeare's Macbeth or any play, we have to approach the great oeuvre of the wide gamut of Shakespearean world of drama in a special way. See, today when we talk about a play like Winter's Tale, we call it a tragic comedy. Or when we talk about Measure for Measure, we call it a problem play. But during Shakespeare's time, during Elizabethan time, Shakespearean drama was basically divided, remained basically divided into only three types, tragedy, comedy, and history. Remember, this history is not historical tragedy. Naturally, Elizabethans had a very deep interest in history. They had a deep historical sense, what we can call as strong historical sense, a taste for history, a flair for history, an appetite for history. So by borrowing the sources from history is to feed, cater to the appetite of Elizabethan audience. Right. At the same time, Shakespeare had the distinct genre called history play which later came to be known as history play proper, H-P-P, capitals, history play proper. It was a jargon, a name used for his subgenre, which called history, histories, especially Henry Yard, English histories. These plays are not the ones like Antony and Cleopatra or Julius Caesar. Though the sources for those two plays were from history, you cannot call them Shakespearean history play proper. What is then history play proper? You can call Julius Caesar or Antony and Cleopatra as historical tragedies, Roman tragedies, King Lear as English tragedy, but they are all tragedies focusing upon the moral vision, 
whether it is Hamarshia or poetic justice or revenge motive or the uh, Chaucerian cycle of fortune, whatever it is, it focused mainly on the moral vision the audience are requested to understand from the real historical event. Whereas in history, there is a paradigm shift, basic shift. The shift of focus is from moral vision to political necessity. We try to understand the history History in itself as a theme, the actions taken by the lead characters or necessities of time. We are not to ask the moral questions there always. Do you understand? So the focus was shifted from moral vision to political expediency. History in itself became a theme to understand it as the chain of action reaction. Shakespeare wrote eight plays covering 200 years of the immediate past of England. These plays, he did not write them in the chronological order. The success of his play, Henry VI, part one, inspired, motivated Shakespeare to travel back and forth for 200 years to write eight plays, beginning from Richard II, proceeding on to Henry IV in two parts, Henry IV, part one, and Henry IV, part two, Henry V. Henry the sixth in three parts and Richard the third. These eight plays can be rightly called history play proper because they focus upon the political necessities. Shakespeare in Henry the fourth part two makes, chooses the character Earl of Warwickshire to utter the immortal lines spoken on history. There is a history in every man's life. There is a history in every man's life. Knowing that, understanding that today, the present is the result of the past. The present is the produce, the product of the past. One can prophesy the future to its near exactitude. Earl of Warwickshire says in Hindi, the fourth part two. Very interestingly, Shakespeare was born in Warwickshire, Stratford upon Yeward. So as a tribute to his birthplace, he chooses Earl of Warwickshire as the mouthpiece to the authorial voice, the Reisenauer to utter the immortal lines explicating Shakespeare's understanding of the individual's life and history. Individual's life, the protagonist's life as a microcosm of the larger universe history. Do you know why? Shakespeare entered tragedy through history. The earliest play written by Shakespeare was neither a tragedy, not a tragedy. It was actually a history. So when Shakespeare sees the life of an individual, the protagonist, the tragic hero, he is reminded of the historical sense in that. What does it say about the time in which the character lived? Is the character the product of the time? What we can call as the fool of the time? Was he fooled by the time? Or was he the architect of the time? 
these were the questions which engaged Shakespeare in dramatizing history or individual's life. I told you he had only three major genres. What is the proof there? The proof is three flags, three colored flags were used. Black for tragedy, yellow for comedy, and blue for history. That's all. So, the tragic vision of Shakespeare should be understood. There is a history in every man's life. To understand a play like Macbeth or Hamlet or Othello, you should have a historical, social, political sense to have a complete understanding of the character as the product of time. You see? As well as someone who tried to frown at fate. Do you understand? This is very important. So, Shakespeare's tragic vision in itself. When we read history of tragedy, Western tragedy, the first concept which comes to our mind is Aristotelian tragedy. Because Aristotle was the one who defined tragedy in his famous work, The Poetics. Using the three great tragedians, Ascanius, Sophocles, and Euripides as models for defining tragedy. There is, there are differences between Ascalus and Sophocles and Sophocles and Euripides, but they define certain common salient features of tragic drama, such as catharsis, Kamarshia, Ginoman, protagonist, you see, the protagonist. The tragic hero is defined as good, but not as too good, as a human being. He is not beyond errors, flaws. So, though he is very good, the noblest of the human beings in the world created by that particular play, there is a flaw in his character which causes his downfall. This tragic flaw is called Hamarshia, H A M G or T A Y. At the same time, as the etymology of tragedy defines, tragedy means goat song. The literal meaning of tragedy is goat song, the song of the goat or goat song which in itself can be interpreted in three ways. One, the actors who played in tragedy used to wear a mask resembling half goat, half human being. Half goat, half human being. Like wearing an eye cover goat mask, leaving the human mouth open, standing on two legs, using two hands for gestures. So it would appear like Goats singing. So tragedy could be song of the goat. Secondly, from the performative aspect, from the festival aspect, if the first is the performative aspect, the actors wearing the mask of goat, the second is the festival aspect. As a Dionysian festival, the best tragedy was awarded with goats. So you can say singing for goat to get the prize, giving the best performance to get the first place, to be rewarded with the prize, something like an Olympic prize, you see, ivy crown, something like that, you see. Thirdly, as I told you, the protagonist is the noblest of the characters. In that world created by that place. So the noblest of the character sacrificed at the altar of God 
to cleanse the world of its sin and guilt. Almost biblical, later biblical. You see, the noblest of the character sacrificed at the altar of God to cleanse the world of its sin and guilt, to appease the gods, sacrificing the noblest, the best product. So, tragedy means the scapegoat. The first is performative, the second is festive, and the third are competitive, and the third is philosophic. So, the protagonist of a tragic drama is good, but not too good. There is one flaw in the character. This flaw, tragic flaw, is called Hamashia. It could be hubris, pride, as in T.S. Eliot's murder in the cathedral, or it could be jealousy in Othello, or ambition, greed in Macbeth, or procrastination in Hamlet, or excess in Antony and Cleopatra, or hastiness in Romeo and Juliet. It can be anything. It is a tragic flaw. Because of the tragic flaw, the best man falls. This is one concept. The second concept is that the character, is he the fool of the time, like Othello, who suspected his most virtuous wife, most virtuous woman, Desdemona? Or is he trying to be the architect of time, the tailor of time, as Hamlet saying, time is out of joint. Oh, cursed spite, that I was never made to set it right. Why did God choose me to set the disintegrated time? Right. Why me? This is a question raised by Hamlet in the play. Whereas Othello is the fool of the time. You have to read, give a new historical approach to read while reading Othello. How he was fooled by the political, social, hmm, historical climate of his time. Okay. So, these are many tragic visions are possible. Hamlet is called a revenge tragedy. Though physical violence in Hamlet is minimal, the psychological, emotional violence is unthinkable. If Macbeth is the shortest play of Shakespeare and Hamlet is the lengthiest play of Shakespeare. Why is it so powerful as a revenge tragedy, Hamlet? Or even if you focus on Macduff, in Macbeth, Macduff, uh, the loyal follower of uh, King Duncan and his sons, who kills Macbeth in the climax, in the final battle in the play. He, when he kills, he tells Hamlet, Macbeth, he, he avenges the death of his wife and son, whom Macbeth set people to kill and did so. So this can also be taken from Macduff's point of view, the revenge tragedy. But Hamlet is out and out the revenge tragedy. Why is it celebrated as Shakespeare's most enigmatic, most powerful play, Hamlet, the tragedy of Prince of Denmark? You see? Why? Because the revenge motive in itself is dealt there in a unique way. Not the physical violence, but the psychological, emotional violence, the spiritual, philosophical dilemma in the character. It can even be called a tragedy of moral idealism. How Shakespeare was able to write such a play? The second point is that Shakespeare entered the world of tragedy with Senecan concept of tragedy. Seneca, the fifth century Roman playwright, defined a new tragedy form after the Greek classical times. 
she defined a different form of tragedy. That tragedy, easily called Senecan tragedy, because he defined, also is known as revenge tragedy. And those plays were considered recitatio, recitatio, singular, recitatio, plural. Why so? Because of the gory violence and bloodshed in the text, these plays were considered not to be enacted on stage, but rather to be read and shelved, or recited and listened to, rather than enacted and watched. The improbability of staging these plays earned the notorious name closet drama. Closet, closet, closet drama. Something which is kept in the shelf, not on the stage. You see, ironically, Senecan revenge tragedy entered Elizabethan world before Aristotelian tragedy could. That is the thing. So when Shakespeare started staging plays, she was so used to revenge tragedy as well as Aristotelian tragedy. So you find revenge as a recurring motive in the plays. The strong motive. It can even be such a romantic tragedy like Romeo and Juliet. Why Romeo is banished? Romeo is banished because he revenged, he avenged the death of his friend hmm, by killing Tybot, Juliet's cousin. That is the reason for his banishment. That caused the climactic disaster, the death of two beautiful lovers, young lovers, innocent lovers. So revenge time and again enters Shakespearean tragedy as a recurring motif, M-O-T-I-F, motif. The plural is motifs. Then, thirdly, what you have to understand is, like the shift you find between Ascalian tragedies and Sophoclean tragedies, Ascalian perceived man as predestined, predetermined. So this individual in Ascalian tragedies hmm, was pitted against the cosmic design. So the conflict came rather from out, from without. Like in Homeric epics, when you read Homeric epics, you experience emotionally the battle between individuals and the cosmic design, like trying to overcome fate, where it is Priam or Achilles, you see, whether it is Priam or Achilles, opposite parties. Both of them try to overcome fate. You see. So in Homeric, epics, in Ascalian tragedies, you find the conflict coming from without, the individual pitted against the cosmic design, whereas in Sophoclean tragedies, as in the epic written by Virgil, the focus is shifted from the predestined universe to the inner space what they call in Tamil as Agam. The space without is called Puram. The space within is called Agam. You see? So this space within, character becomes the destiny. The conflict is not from without. The conflict is more of within. If it is Anthony, Anthony is drawn between Caesar and Cleopatra. Caesar, Rome, beauty, measure. Cleopatra, Alexandria, excess, luxury. If it is Hamlet, it is whether to believe the ghost or not to believe the ghost. You see, what is true, what is wrong. Even in history, if it is Henry V, when she was Prince Hall, she was drawn between Hotspur, the person who always, who has no holidays, and Falstaff, 
for him the whole life is a holiday so he wants to strike a balance between hotsperian extreme and faustian extreme this is how we must understand so in shakespeare unlike in other playwrights the conflict is more from within than from without so these are the three things you have to bear in your mind when you read the text and try to stage it in the portrayal of the character see shakespeare himself considered the wide gamut the kaleidoscopic vision of characters he has created especially in tragedy you can apply that to comedy also or history also but more importantly than the other two genres in tragedy in shakespearean tragedy the characters can be the major characters can be divided into identified as belonging to divided into three categories one is the characters who represent order system like elder hamlet in the play like duncan king duncan in macbeth king duncan you see and the second type of characters are perversion of order the characters who disintegrate order the characters who disturb order the characters who usher in disorder you see these characters like claudius in hamlet like macbeth in the play and the third type of characters or the characters who restore order restoration of order in the dinoman dinoman means resolution clarification of dramatic action dinoman is the final space in the, in the trajectory of tragic uh, drama you see we will talk about that later in the second session we'll talk about that this is an introductory session for um, shakespearean tragedy in general and uh, macbeth in particular now the question is the question the restoration of order who antony in julius caesar for example in julius caesar julius caesar represented order brutus casca cinna cassius they represented perversion of order Antony represented restoration of order. Am I right? In Hamlet, the elder Hamlet represented order. Claudius, his brother who killed him, usurped the throne and married his brother's wife, the queen. Get through. Became Hamlet's uncle. You see, by all rights, by filial right, hmm. he became so. this fellow represents disturbance of order perversion of order and hamlet himself represents restoration of order like antony like macbeth malcolm in macbeth now the question is the physical title macbeth why didn't shakespeare name it after duncan as in julius caesar or malcolm or macduff as in hamlet why did he choose the character who disturbed the order who destroyed the order who ushered in disorder to be the titular character why should it be there is a question we cannot just conclude it as to create pity and fear the catharsis the purgatorial process the strongest the emotions which could be attained inside a theater a playhouse you see we cannot there is something else there is something else as i have already told you was this character the fool of kind 
I already talked about the length of the plate. It is the shortest plate. Now the pace of the plate. Othello is the fast paced play, fastest play, moving play written by in Shakespeare's Ouvre. But Othello uses a double time. Actually, the play happens for two days. That's all. But you feel like watching the life of Othello for many days. He doesn't allow, the playwright doesn't allow you to think about the short duration in which Othello married Desdemona, suspected her and murdered her. That will spoil the stature of the character and the love, the grandeur of the love. It happened so fast. So Shakespeare, without allowing the audience to focus upon the real time, she shifts the focus to something going on for a long time. She gives the illusion of a double time, the long time. Whereas Macbeth is unichronal. It follows single time. So what is important is the pitching of the action. Where does Shakespeare pitch the action in Macbeth? That is important. Always the departure of a plot structure and the destination of the plot structure, the writer should have the clear idea in his or her mind. Where does the play start and where should it begin? Because life is long, history is long. You have to choose a moment, a particular moment, to begin the plot structure and a particular moment to end the plot structure. That's very important. Shakespeare generally opens his place very sensational, opens with a bang. You see, it may be a street brawl as in Romeo and Juliet, or it may be the hurrying scene in Motello, or it may be the ghost haunting in uh, Hamlet. Now, this play also begins with thunder and lightning. The play opens with the witches, the three witches. These three witches speak. You see, the first act of Macbeth is, appears to be many scenic, but short scenes like film cutting, economy and precision, frequent shifting of scene, short scenes. You see, when shall we three meet again? in thunder, lightning, or in the rain, when the hurly-burly is done, when the battle is lost and won, that will be before the set of the sun, where the place upon the heap, that to meet Macbeth again, that to meet Macbeth, fair is foul and foul is fair, over through the fog and fill the air. That is the concluding statement. That is the topical statement. That is the thematic statement of the short opening scene in which we are introduced to the three witches, the three weird sisters. Uncanny feeling is created in our mind, according to Freudian psychology. The feeling of uncanny, uncanny is created. Eeriness is created when the witches sum up their distorted, staccato like conversation, dialogue, the three witches in Harry's foul and foul is fair. So the question now is, is it, is, is it the corruption of the time? Has the protagonist corrupted the time or has the time corrupted the protagonist? Like the poem by Nassim Masekiel, infected by the world, corrupted by the world, I must infect the world with my corruption. What it is a vicious circle. The witches also speak equivocally. You are not able to arrive at the straight meaning as you find in the reversal of order. Hair is foul and foul is fair. Okay, we will meet in the next session. Thank you very much.